strong start for the Bison in week one as they rewrite the record books on offense, throttling Mississippi Valley State 72 to seven. But today is a whole new ball game. The Bison are on the road at Eastern Washington. They've met before and both times took overtime. It's Gage Guru and a new army of options fighting to click as quick as possible. Taking on a Bison defense that has taken blow after blow this season. But the NDSU offense is thriving with new names rising and familiar faces playing their best ball yet. It's game day in Washington as the Bison look for their first ever win at Ruse Field. This is the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football Pregame Show. Hello and welcome into our Fargo studios. You are watching the Farmers Union Insurance Buys and Football pregame show. I am Alex Egan. She is Beth Houle. There was so much that we were going to talk to you about. We were going to talk about 2010. We were going to talk about the last two times that these teams have met, the only two times they've met, how it's required overtime. We were going to talk about all of that right off the top of the show here, but then we got a bomb dropped on us on Thursday, and that was Nick DeLuca's injury. Yeah, that's that, right. Nick DeLuca uh, found out Thursday night is when I got my first tip that something was going on with Nick DeLuca. Uh, got an injury update from him, was told a knee injury. Now, the initial reports were that it was an ACL injury. It ended up not being an ACL injury. NDSU coming out 11 a.m. on Friday, announcing uh, by, by way of Jeremy Jorgensen on Bison 1660 that it was a non-ACL knee injury. Now that is the only official confirmation that we have right now. Again, Thursday night, I got initial word that there was a knee injury to Nick DeLuca and that it didn't look good. That word ACL, this would be the sixth yeah, knee injury already this year third ACL already in just less than a week yeah uh, if it had been but again not an ACL injury got that news 11 a.m. then I was able to confirm that Nick would be on the road to Eastern Washington on Friday heading out there and with still no word on whether or not he will or will not be playing so that's what we know right now we are going to go out to Ruse Field in Eastern Washington Ryan Gellner was on the team flight Ryan you saw Nick on that team flight. What can you tell us? I did, guys, and you want to talk storylines. There are all sorts of storylines, but let's start there with Nick DeLuca. Nick was on the airplane. He traveled with the team. No noticeable limp from Nick. I saw him this morning. Uh, he will warm up. I have not seen him take the field yet, which is not unusual for Nick. He's one of the last ones out onto the field. He will warm up, I am told today, and uh, his status right now is unknown, and I truly believe that NDSU doesn't quite know the extent of the injury. They are calling it a meniscus injury, but beyond that, we don't know much, and I don't know if North Dakota State knows much, so we'll follow along, watch Nick in warm-ups. We'll get you some video of that as soon as he hits the field, and we'll watch all of that as this thing plays out, but there are so many storylines here, guys. You want to talk... Earlier in the week, the talk was about the weather and the smoke from the fires. There are fires burning here in Washington to our south in Oregon, to our east in Idaho and in Montana, and that had forced Eastern Washington outdoor, or rather indoors all week. They have not practiced outdoors. Uh, they did travel two hours the other day to practice outdoors. That was the first time they could get outside. Yesterday, they had a walk through here, but their whole practice week has been crazy. You talked about the 2010 matchup. I was here in 2010 when Brock Jensen was ruled to have fumbled. I was at last year's game when Bruce Dunn went to the house in overtime. These two teams, for not knowing each other, certainly know each other a whole lot. There are so many storylines in this one. We can go back and forth, and there's so much to talk about. This is what it's about, and here's the interesting thing. This game in early September is going to be a game that well, they look at in late November when they're trying to seed teams into the playoffs. That's how important this one is, guys. Well put, Ryan. With that, I think we can pack it up and go home. Yeah, I think we'll he hit them it, all. We'll that's, call it a day. That's well, exactly. That, I mean, you're absolutely right, Ryan. This is a, a huge game, a huge matchup with huge implications, but it could mean so much more if they can have Nick DeLuca in this football game. Yeah, let's get back to topic A1, and that is Nick DeLuca and what he is what he brings to this football team and what we saw it last year, we, he, met, he played the first three games of the season. He had to take the medical redshirt with the shoulder injury that he suffered in the first game of the year. And now to get this news on a practice, it happened yeah. in practice. And that's, that's the tough part about it is it happened during practice. So that's 
what you have to be able to avoid, but you got to practice these And guys. it was a fluke accident. It, right. it was a fluke accident. From what I have been told, uh, it was a Wednesday at practice, um, and a young guy, no contact, took a little spill, um, and Nick jumped to avoid him. And so uh, Nick not taking any hard contact on that, but the coaches immediately went over to him, uh, concerned, obviously, uh, yeah. uh, about the potential to lose Nick DeLuca. He said he was fine. He said he was absolutely fine. Um, but then the swelling occurred, and then obviously uh, um, the, the From concern. From some more tests, you get your you right. get what and, the injury Right, and now they, they are saying meniscus, and that's what we had, uh, what had heard once ACL was dispelled. Um, and that is a little bit better. A, a meniscus is not a season-ending in, season injury. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it right. can come back. And NDSU fans, you may remember, you've seen guys play through and come back from meniscus injuries. The likes of C.J. Smith, Marcus Williams. And you were able to catch up with Marcus and ask him, hey, what, what do you think, you know, you've dealt with this. So what do you have, any words of encouragement for Nick? And Absolutely, yeah. I was able to reach out to Marcus Williams via text message. Uh, he's obviously preparing for his season with the New busy. York Jets. Uh, but he, he was able, and this is um, a little bit of what he said to me, really just focusing on the guy more than the injury and the implications for the team. He was able to say that he, he really hopes um, that Nick can keep his head up and keep working through this. And the thing about a meniscus, though, it's really tough to come back to that 90, even 100% uh, good feeling on it. Um, but he says, you know, if he can't play, he's got to be that vocal leader and he's got to be able to lead this team. And unfortunately, Nick has experience. Yeah, with Nick that. is all too familiar with being the vocal leader on the sideline and not being able to contribute on the field. So that is certainly uh, the area of concern. Like Ryan said, he's supposed to warm up. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen him out there just yet, but if we do see him, I think we might see Nick get, and get this, to go. And the reason Nick is so vital to this game, I think beyond the personal side of it, because for me, I think, gosh, Nick DeLuca, he's such a good right. kid. He's such a hardworking young man. He's been dealt so many tough blows and the these NFL last couple years. The NFL is a potential for this yes. young man, but beyond that, in this game in particular, Nick DeLuca was moving back into his home, that, that middle linebacker spot he was going to be quarterbacking this defense because he is so <laughs> lethal when it comes to his ability to stop that pass game and to rush the passer and to lock down Gabe Gage Gubrud who's a real big threat my goodness is Gage Gubrud a big threat and we'll talk a little bit about Gage as well we'll learn a little bit more about the Eastern Washington Eagles we'll catch up with play-by-play -play man Larry Weir plus we've got a whole bunch of other stuff to get you to all and those talking points all those things that we were going to talk about <laughs> we'll still talk about them plus a new edition of heard this one you don't want to miss it Tuska that's all still Brothers to come here off. on the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football pregame show Buys and players out on the Inferno, the red turf there in Eastern Jeff Washington. Jeff Ilias stretching out right there, that Alex. It is Jeff Ilias stretching out right there. The tight end had a big game against Eastern Washington a year ago. Did not play in the season opener. We might see 86 on the field today. We'll see. Oh, gosh, he would be a force. We, I mean, like nice. you said, we've seen what he can do against them. He did it last year. Yes. Uh, I know he's hungry to get back on the field today. Uh, certainly hoping he's one coming back. We'll talk about injuries coming up a little bit later on in the show as we uh, get into this football game. But let's now go back out to Ruse Field. Ryan Gellner standing by with longtime voice of the Eagles, Larry Weir. Ryan? Yeah, thank you, guys. Larry Weir in his 27th year calling play-by-play -play for the Eagles. Larry, this has been a crazy week, but in talking to you just a little bit ago, you told us that it's not so unnormal for this team. Yeah, about the last three years, Ryan, we've had a lot of problems with smoke here, but it's usually been in August, not in September. Uh, but we haven't had rain here in about two and a half months. Uh, today, in fact, we tie the longest stretch of, of uh, no precipitation in the region uh, in history, and that comes off the wettest winter in history. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not as bad today as it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're just, you know, crazy here. And then you back up with last week, which was a pretty unconventional week in the way that the other game ended. Uh, that's not Eastern Washington football the way you know it. No, you know, it had been t since 2009 since Eastern had gotten handled by an FBS opponent. Uh, and that game, they got physically beaten up by Cal. Texas Tech was a different situation. It was more uh, just poor execution by Eastern. Um, and that's, you know, they got a lot of mistakes to clean up going into this ball game here today. And, and we'll see whether they can get it all done in a week. Two-part question to finish here. These two teams, for not playing each other very often, 
seem to know a lot about each other. With that said, though, you guys seem to put it on the ground last week, running the football maybe more than you have before. Is that maybe this style this year? Well, uh, head coach Aaron Best is an offensive lineman. He played center here at Eastern in the mid to late 90s, and so he wants to, to establish the run a little bit more than maybe Coach Baldwin did prior to him or Coach Wolf did prior to that. So they want to establish a ground game more. It'll be interesting to see if they can do it today. A little breezy today, so a, a little run game would help Eastern a lot, I'm sure. As it would the Bison as well. Thank you, Larry. All right, thanks, Ryan. Alex, Beth, back to you guys. All right, thank you very much to Ryan and to Larry for taking some time and talking to us. Uh, one of the guys that is on this Eastern team, Bison fans are familiar with, if you saw the game last year, and that is old number eight. Yes, Gage Gubrud is a very good quarterback. He has, like, all of the records already yeah. for Eastern Washington. Uh, he, he's a force to be reckoned with. And you know what? Last year, what stood out to me, uh, the, the Bison defense played good. I know Bison fans got on defensive coordinator Matt Entz last year for this game, thinking that the game plan wasn't good, thinking they weren't playing good defense. That wasn't the case. If you go back and watch this game again, like we have, you'll see they just got beat by Gage. Beat. They didn't get beat, but they just got beat well, by Gage Gubrud. Yeah, he, he extended plays. He kept things going uh, when he shouldn't have, when he shouldn't have been able to. So Gage Gubrud is very good at throwing the football on the run, and that's one of the things that I think is scariest, and one of the reasons why you would like to have Nick DeLuca in this game is because Gage Gubrud can break contain and still make a play. That is what Gage Guru does best. And yes, he can throw the football well. The thing that is concerning to me, I watched the first game, Eastern Washington against Texas Tech, and I saw that Gage wasn't getting any help. He played fantastic in that game, uh, you know, throwing for 22 completions, what have you. But he was the victim of a lot of drops from his wideouts. And he Eastern has Washington, a lot of new receivers. Yes, Eastern Washington lost three guys that were vying for NFL spots. Two of them actually made the NFL rosters and one of them everybody knows his name because he was the player of the universe in Cooper Cup so those are the guys that that Gage doesn't have anymore right and that's what he needs to start to get his uh consistency and familiarity with his receivers and his playmakers and I I don't know that two games in we're gonna see it yeah I don't think we're gonna see it yet I don't think they're there and they haven't had again it sounds kind of trivial but when you're talking about air quality and this football team not being able to practice they were moved inside where the turf is uh, better set for like a track and field event than yeah. for practicing football they haven't been able to practice they had to ship themselves quite a distance we've heard a couple of hours even yeah. to be able to practice outside because the air quality was so bad that those corrections they needed to make from week one I don't think they've had the time to really do it's definitely been uh, some adversity for him let's take a look at Gage's numbers from last week he was 22 of 34 passing he had 207 yards against a pretty good that's a big 12 team that he played in Texas Tech and uh, he threw a touchdown the pick not really known wasn't for their his defense fault. though right the pick really wasn't his fault not rushing that's not what Gage Cooper does he does it just fine but he's more of a Look passer and uh, yeah I mean this kid is the real deal 5,000 yards 5,000 yards is yeah. a feat in FCS football it it's a feat in any form of football but to, to get it done in the FCS, that, that is, is really good. And it is. He won the job as a sophomore last year. He yeah. unseated a senior. No, he's good. Kid he's is very good. good. He's very good. But it looks like he might have some trouble. Uh, let's take a live look out yeah, to Root could. Field right now where you will see Nick DeLuca warming up on the field. Full pads, giving it a go. Looks comfortable running. Um, what this means now, again, this is football. So is this a play? Gamesmanship. Is this gamesmanship? Yeah. Are, are they putting him out there to keep Eastern sweating? I'm not sure. Um, I'm willing to bet this is Nick DeLuca evaluating it for himself and seeing if he thinks he's good to go. We'll catch up with Bison head coach Chris Kleiman and see what his thoughts are on Nick DeLuca's injury. Plus, we've got a whole bunch of other things to talk about, including more injuries that the Bison suffered last week. Boy, those were some tough, tough pills to swallow yeah. this week. Man, it's just been hit after hit after hit for the Bison here. We'll have all that for you still to come here on the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football Free Game Show. Welcome back inside our Fargo studios, the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football Pregame Show, getting you set for NDSU and Eastern Washington. The topic of discussion all the past couple of days, I guess, this. is injuries. And why not go talk to a doctor? 
Let's do that. So <laughs> grind down there, can. catching up with Dr. Bruce Pyatt for our Sanford Sports Medicine and Orthopedics Injury Report. Hi, guys. It is the Sanford Health Injury Report, as you said, and Dr. Bruce Pyatt joins us. And uh, Doc Pyatt, uh, boy, knees have come up again this week, so let's start there. Knee injuries uh, starting to stack up for this football team. Uh, you and I had talked a little bit previous that uh, this is common across college football. Yeah, obviously any sport activity puts you at risk, but football in general uh, with the uh, tremendous shoe wear that we have nowadays, the tremendous fields that we have that allow very high athletic competition, it does put a tremendous amount of load and uh, opportunity for high mechanism injuries to our athletes and something has to give. And in this case, it's the knee often, unfortunately. We've heard the acronym ACL, but uh, let's focus on meniscus because uh, that's certainly a, a topic right now. What is a meniscus injury? So the meniscus in your knee, there's only a few joints in our body that have a meniscus. Most prominently, we talk about it with the knee. And what it is, it's a piece of soft tissue or cartilage that sits between the bones in the knee. There's two of them in the knee that are C-shaped, one on the inside called the medial meniscus, one on the outside called the lateral meniscus. They serve a purpose to help give a little bit of shock, shock absorption to the knee, but more what they do is they kind of spread out the force in the knee so that the cartilage on the end of your bone sees a lot less stress. And that's really Really important for the long term of the knee to have that there without it then we start to run into a lot of problems with degenerative things so when you hear of people tearing cartilage it's generally that meniscus cartilage that we talk about how about recovery time on a typical knee uh, on the meniscus yeah we really have two options uh, what we do with the knee when uh, it's been damaged or torn if it's repairable we try to repair it uh, in almost all situations just because it's so detrimental to the knee for the long run to lose it um, if it's not repairable then we just trim out the tear so if we just do something where we trim it out that's the scenario where an athlete could have a knee scoped and be back playing in a week or two uh, so you can recover very quickly from that but if we have to do a repair we're going to shut them down from athletic competition for at least six months and then it's a time from there to kind of get that leg back in shape so it can be even longer than that to fully get back on the field real quickly last week we talked about heat injuries anything special you do today 80 degrees in the stadium maybe 90 coming off the field anything special to monitor today you know, I think we're going to be fortunate here today. It is warm, but uh, it's not real humid. And it's also, we got a little bit of breeze going through, so I think that will help us. But we'll do the things we always do, and that we'll monitor the athletes. We'll make sure they're hydrating well. We make sure that their electrolytes are balanced well with some of the additives and supplements that we can give them as necessary, and we'll just continue to do that. Appreciate the time today. Thank you. Alex, Beth, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Ryan and Dr. Pia. We appreciate that. Uh, here is the injury report for today. This is just some of the names that we uh, have listed here. Nick DeLuca with his knee injury. You just kind of heard about meniscus injuries and what that all takes. Uh, he is doubtful, but we've seen him on the field, so he's going to probably try to give it a go. He'll warm it up and see what happens. Such a competitor. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, Dylan Radins, uh, he suffered a, a torn ACL last week against Mississippi Valley State. He is out for the season, along with Damaris Purifoy, who also uh, suffered a knee injury and is out for the season. Yeah, that's right. Dylan Radins is a big loss for the offensive line. He comes in uh, after redshirting last year, um, but with a lot of great experience uh, in championship caliber programs. In high school, uh, he won national or won state championships, uh, had a winning record, um, and he played left tackle. He has that experience, and that's somewhere where, as anybody who knows much about football knows, you need that left tackle spot. He was somebody that they saw holding down that spot for the longevity of his career here he's now pushed back in that and the unfortunate thing for him is he already has his red shirt year so getting That's another right. red shirt both will him not and purify purifoy will not be able to red shirt uh, medical red shirts only come when it's extenuating circumstances right. it, you'll remember zach vra he had uh, the same collarbone injury multiple times. He was able to get that sixth year. That's very odd. It's very rare to continue to have these things. A regular red shirt to, to keep your activity does not put you in this position. And you remember Nick DeLuca came off of a red shirt last year, and that's because he played as a true freshman. Right. He still had the red shirt available, so they were able to use that. So that's he, right. uh, Radins and Purifoy both out. Jackson Brown suffered a knee injury. Are we sensing a theme here? Knee injury seems to be the thing. Yeah. The good news is, though, there is some good news. Jeff Ilias, we saw him warming up as well. He is going to try and give it a go today. So that's Coming back from a knee injury as uh, well. Yes, also a knee injury. So th th that's some good news. We, we've seen DeLuca out on the field. We've seen Jeff Ilias out on the field. That's 
those are those are two really nobody good things. has ever questioned if the bison were tough though we know that no. these guys want to be out there this is a big game for these guys they're excited about it and as ryan alluded to earlier this game has playoff implications you might not want to talk about it right now it's right. not a will they or won't they make the playoffs if they don't win this game but this will have an effect in those seedings and everything as we get to november i know it's september but as we hey, get there both of these teams were in the national semifinals last year so this is a no joke this is the premier game in the fcs this year a top 10 or this week i should say a top 10 matchup a number two versus here. number six number here. seven it it very well could be this might be a prelude to what we might see down in frisco should eastern washington figure out their new style of offense and everything uh we talked about jeff Ilias coming back yep. and that's good news for old number 12 on the bison sideline because easton stick Oh my goodness, Did he, was he ever efficient? That was the word that he used. Yes. Was he ever efficient in uh, last week's game against Mississippi Valley State? Let's take a look is at that, his numbers. What, what do you take from that, though? Is nothing. That, absolutely okay. nothing. I take nothing from this other than look at that completion percentage. 100%. <laughs> here we go. You always like to see it. And you know what I take from this? I take that maybe the Bison built a little bit of confidence up. They feel good. They're comfortable. They've got the new offensive coordinator, and, and it's clicking unlike what we saw for Eastern Washington last week. And that's a good place to be right now. I'm still looking at that 100% completion percentage. That, that is a beautiful thing to see. We've been talking about completion percentage, completion percentage. I yeah. can't even say it. That's how I, I'm done talking about it. We're going to keep talking about it. Obviously, that, that 65 number is what we want to see. But five for five against a team that is not. Right. I but, mean, Mississippi Valley State. But what stands out about it? What I, I spoke to a couple of former Bison football players this week, and they said what they liked about what they've seen, uh, even in last week, is how much how much bigger the opportunities are for Easton to hit his receivers. They're, they're not throwing into quite the tight spaces that were so expected, but when you're taking over after Carson Wentz, you know, that's what the team is used to. That's what the offense is drawn up for. And uh, Coach Messingham maybe opening up the, that, that area a little bit more for him, giving the receivers a little bit more uh, radius around themselves to be able to catch the ball a little bit more space. And I think we're seeing the results of that. Yeah, the Bison uh, certainly, again, the word that Easton said was efficient. He actually said after the game, he said, you know, we had a couple penalties we'd like to clean up. I was like, you went five for five. Perfectionist. For 100 yards, That's what you, you want from your football touchdowns. team. We had a few penalties that we needed to clean Outside up. Outside of knee injuries, <laughs> everything we have seen this year, I am in love with with this football team. They're yeah. telling you what I want to hear, and, and they're following through with it as well. Ten touchdowns certainly doesn't hurt in your uh, debut for Courtney Messingham as the offensive coordinator. So Confidence. that 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 is certainly nice. We'll see. I don't think ten touchdowns is in the cards today, but hey, you never know. Uh, you never know. All right. <laughs> Nothing to refute that. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I don't we, want to we tried you something too much. new. Yeah, please don't. Please. <laughs> uh, we tried something new last week um, where we had the guys get together on media day and, you know, tell a joke or two, see what they had. You guys seem to like it, so we brought it back. And this time, it is a family matter. That's right. playing an instrument, an orchestra. What do you call four bullfighters in quicksand? Quattro Cinco. What did the buffalo say to his little boy when he dropped him off for school? Bye, son. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. <laughs> Hello. This is the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football Pregame Show. Now, earlier in the week in Spokane, that's just a few miles away from Cheney, Washington. We'll take it to it. This is what the scene was, the smoke from all of those wildfires burning Tuesday. around. Tuesday. Yeah, this was Tuesday. Uh, fortunately, the, the wind has kind of picked up today. But this is what Eastern Washington was forced to do. They had to go inside into like a field house, and that is not enough space to practice a football Look team. Look at that surface. The surface is not right, and that is uh, what Eastern Washington was having to deal with all this week. Fortunately, it looks like the winds of change have come in, and we have a couple guys that know a thing or two about um, the winds of change, if you will. 
I'll tell you about it later. Let's it. go out to Ryan Gellner, Brian Sean, and Lee Timmerman. Guys. Hey, uh, hi, guys, and welcome again to Ruse Field in Cheney, Washington, where the winds have changed. Air quality not going to be a problem, but it certainly was. You're right. They practiced indoors Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, drove two hours on Thursday to practice outside, and then yesterday had a walkthrough here on the field. So uh, really the winds, though, have changed. We're not going to have an air quality problem today, Lee. No, and that's good because earlier this week, believe it or not, in the entire world, Spokane had the worst air quality. Worse than Beijing, China, believe it or not. So today is a blessing. It's the best day. Brian, they even canceled high school football across the state yesterday. The winds, though, may play a factor in this game, but it's not smoke that they may play a factor with. No, it, that winds have picked up. They're going to be close to 15, 20 miles an hour. We'll see how that affects each team. Certainly, you'd think it affects Eastern Washington more in the passing game, but we found out yesterday that it's state law that you cannot play an athletic event when the levels hit 150. They were still at 150 this morning, but by mid-morning got down to 130 and are now below 100. So... I'm not an air quality expert, but I do know that much, and that was a big factor in why we don't have any haze right. in the air today. It's a beautiful day. We're a long ways from the ocean, but if you picture it on the map, the air blowing or the wind blowing from the ocean across the state of Washington and pushing everything away from us. So we'll see how wind goes. Let's get into RG's keys for the game and break that down just a little bit. Our keys, we start with number one on our keys, and that is B special. Missing last week from the 72 points that the Bison scored and the 10 extra points were the field goals that were missed by Cam Peterson. That is a big deal the bison coaches want him to hit makeable field goals he did not do that a week ago and to me it goes beyond that for special teams punt return kick coverage those areas have to be shored up for north dakota state because in a game like this that could be a big difference moving on to number two it is the play action pass for north dakota state for them to be successful well they have to run the football to run the football the bison have done that many many times over the years hey eastern washington knows that so they're going to put an extra guy in the box how do you beat an extra guy in the box play action for North Dakota State I think to be successfully run that play action and then be effective out of it if they can run and they can throw that's danger for Eastern Washington. Well, that's uh, exactly what the Bison want to do. Aaron Best, the head coach for Eastern, was talking about the front seven and, and about NDSU. And whenever you play NDSU, that defensive line and that linebacking core, no matter who's in it, has been such a, a dramatic defensive weapon that, yeah, that front seven is a big concern uh, for on Eastern side. And, yeah, if you can get a little success up the middle, just get that power going a little bit, outside will open up we'll see if the bison do that back into the keys now number three on our keys is keep number eight off balance who's number eight well it's the player that chris Kleiman called maybe the best athlete that they'll face all year it's gage grubrood who threw for 450 yards and four touchdowns against the bison a year ago that was at the dome now outside in the wind it really doesn't matter because grubrood ran it pretty well Brian, they have to figure out a way to keep number eight off balance today, especially bringing pressure. Yeah, when you bring pressure, you have to kind of be calculating how you do it because one thing he did so well last year was run around in the pocket and make guys miss and throw the ball downfield. That's tough when you have to have your defensive backs cover guys for five, six, seven seconds. So I think what Chris Kleiman, what he told us a little bit earlier this week is we're going to bring pressure at times, but we have to be very calculating in how we do it. And he said, by halftime, I think you'd hope that we would see it where it's 50-50 pressure versus playing coverage. Guys, uh, a little bit of uh, news on the injury front. Of course, North Dakota State uh, already got some injuries and going up against that. Add some new ones that we're learning just in the last few minutes. Brock Robbins did not make the trip. We understand a foot injury for the Bison fullback. Dimitri Williams, who we know was pretty limited in practice, he did not make the trip either, so he is out. Dom Davis will play, and as you guys said, Jeff Elias will play. But, Lee, Bison injuries are already starting to stack up yeah that's sad i know that uh, another thing i'll take from an interview i heard from coach best he said uh, about the bison defense that the bison defense has a dude on each level well two of those dudes uh, one of them's menard we, he's not going to play the other one's deluca and we don't even know if he can do anything today or if they want him to well they still have their dude in the backfield that's dempsey who had the big pick last week Brian, they've got a couple other dudes at linebacker that Bison fans may not know yet, but they're going to get to know. Yeah, and I think Dan Marlette and Levi Jordheim have taken dramatic strides. We're going Eastern Washington offense. Finally, Lee, I know, speaking of offense, there might be some new wrinkles for the Bison offense this week. Well, I think so. It's called FIB, formation in the boundary. Look for the Bison today to maybe run some plays to the short side. The boundary is the short side. And depending on where number 33, Karkstetter, lines up, if he's on the wide side, the Bison might want to go quick, and they want to go uh, to the short side of the thing, uh, the field coach Hedberg thought there might be some things over there for him to maybe play a little speed up so throw some speed up against a team that likes to play fast 
It is 79 degrees here in Cheney, Washington, about 10 degrees warmer on the field. That's one other thing to watch is how the Bison deal with this seat. When we come back, lots more from Ruse Field. This is the Valley News Live KVLY KFYR Bison Network. Live on Ruse Field in Cheney, Washington, North Dakota State and Eastern Washington getting set to go the 50th game that uh, Eastern Washington will play here on the red turf. And it's interesting to see how much that will affect the Bison. They don't think it will. They've played here, of course, before in 2010, that playoff game. And uh, we'll see if the red turf plays into anything. If anything, the heat off this turf could play a factor. Again, about 10 degrees warmer, they figure, on the turf than air temperature. Currently 79, but windy here in eastern Washington at Cheney. Uh, about 14, 15 miles an hour, but those gusts could get up to 30 miles per hour. Uh, North Dakota State and Eastern Washington to come just in a little bit on this one. It's one of five Big Sky versus Missouri Valley Conference football games that are going on across the league today. A battle of two of the best conferences in the nation in FCS football. Our Herdline News this week starts with James Hendricks. And what a story James Hendricks is. He moved from quarterback, third stringer a year ago. He is now playing defense, and he's the leading tackler from a week ago. The sophomore strong safety had five solo tackles and an interception last week. What a debut against Mississippi Valley State. And then Brooks and Dunn. You've heard of the country duel? Well, Brooks and Dunn is also a bison duel as well. It is Ty Brooks, the sophomore from uh, Fargo South, and then Lance Dunn. Each had over 100 yards of rushing a week ago. It's the first time NDSU has had over two rushers over 100 yards since 2015. Brooks had 127 yards rushing, including two touchdowns. Dunn was equally as impressive. He had 142 yards on just seven carries, including two touchdowns. As a team, the Bison ran for a Division I team record of 498 rushing yards, and their total offense off the chart. The Bison had 683 yards of total offense a week ago. If they can do that again today, wow. That would be impressive. All of that, well, the offensive line played pretty well. Back into herd line news, it's Tanner Volson who gets the highlight for the offensive line. He was named the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Week by the league office in just his third career start. Volson graded out at 100%, doesn't get any better than that, and did not allow a sack. That is herd line news for today, September 9th, 2017. Well, from offense to defense for the Bison this week, and really the back seven for North Dakota State are going to be leaned on today. Gage Gubru, the quarterback for Eastern Washington, loves to throw the football, and that puts a lot of pressure on the back seven. Now, the question for the Bison is they want to bring pressure. They tried to a year ago. It didn't really work for North Dakota State. Gubrud was able to throw a bunch, and he was also able to run a bunch against NDSU. They want to eliminate that. They will try to do a lot of things to disguise their coverage. They want to bring pressure. Will they bring it on first down, maybe on third down? We'll have to wait and see what the game plan is for that. But the Bryson do want pressure. That'll be something to watch at home. I had a chance to talk to the head coach who's scheming for this football game against a team that he knows pretty well. Here's Chris Kleiman. Chris, you're back in Cheney, Washington. I know you weren't here the last time, but there's a little history between these two teams. For a team you don't play very much, you probably feel like you know them pretty well. Yeah, we really do, and we had a great game against them last fall. Uh, it's a tough environment to play. It's going to be a packed house. It's what you come play at NDSU for is for these type of games and these type of environments, and, and our guys have been looking forward to this one all through camp. It's a big game, non-conference game, but man, I know you don't want to look ahead, but at the end of the season, these are the ones they point to. It's a big game for you guys. It is a big game. All the games are big that we play, and we circle them all, but uh, there's no question that uh, we need to come out here with a great performance. The million-dollar question is Nick DeLuca, and I'll be very generic and just ask you his status of today's game. Well, we're going to warm him up and see what he thinks, and uh, we're going to continue to evaluate him. This is going to be kind of a day-to-day, week-to-week thing with Nick, and uh, it's unfortunate what happened to him in practice, but uh, uh, we'll, we're just going to keep playing it day by day with Nick. Real quick, you got to keep their quarterback off balance. I know that's been a focus all week. How do you do that? Well, you have to contain him in the rush. That's where you heard us last year was scrambling out of the pocket or up in the pocket. And so uh, we've really challenged. We're going to play 10 defensive linemen. We're going to rotate a guy, a lot of guys in there so that when he gets out of the pocket, he's he has that uh, uncanny ability to look downfield rather than just take off and run. And so uh, explosive plays, that's what everybody needs to watch. If we don't give up explosive plays, I like our chances. If we give up explosive plays, we're in for a long day. That certainly is the truth for North Dakota State. The Bison and Eastern Washington about 20 minutes away from kickoff. When we come back, back to the studio in Fargo, 
getting you set for Eastern and North Dakota State. Just about 13 minutes until we send you out to Roos Field in Cheney, Washington on our Coors Light Countdown Clock. We've got a lot of stuff still to get to for us today. Well, let's first start with some of the guys that we think need to have an impact today in our Bobcat Heavy Lifting Report. And we've singled out these three guys, but really... The Wolf Pack. It is the Wolf Pack. And these three guys are Robbie Grinsley, Trey Dempsey, and Jalen Wimbush there. So... What would you like to see out of the Wolf Pack today? Well, I think what you saw last year was not only Gage Gubrud getting to keep plays alive, but then he was able to hit people downfield. And, and that's where some of those struggles came from last year, and that's how they ended up in a shootout with them. If these guys can lock them, can lock down the receivers, they're already struggling, they're already lacking confidence, prey on that weakness and go after it. I think we'll be able to see the Bison be extremely stingy against Eastern Washington. I'm not expecting a ton from them if these guys can lock down and do their jobs. And especially given the unlikeliness, the unknown of Nick DeLuca, these guys need a big game. The, the third point that we have on this graphic here is turnover ratio. The Bison were able to get two very crucial turnovers against Eastern Washington last year. One of them came from Robbie Grimsley, who you see there. He was able to get a pick after Eastern Washington had scored a touchdown and recovered an onside kick. So Eastern Washington had all the momentum in the world, but Gage Goober throws a pick, Robbie Grimsley uh, takes it and back. And that was a heads-up play. It was a smart play, Robbie, yes. Robbie Grimsley was just in position, bounced off of yep. the Eastern Washington guy, and Robbie was there to collect the gold. I mean, that's what you need, just heads-up plays. We also saw Nick DeLuca take a pick back for six, so that mm -hmm. was a very big turning point in that game as well. And then... I mentioned those two big turnovers. The final turnover that the Bison were able to get was Trey Dempsey in the end zone in overtime to nullify Eastern Washington's possession there. So it will be crucial for the Wolfpack, along with pretty much everybody else on Any that defense. Any chance you can get Trey Dempsey involved, though. I mean, the guy is just insane out there. He loves it. He's such a competitor. Um, he's somebody you need dialed up every day. We could put Trey Dempsey oh, for as sure. a Bobcat heavy lifting player uh, every single week. Absolutely. Trey Dempsey is one of those guys that will go out there and ball out and just just – he will have an impact <laughs> on the game. He will have an impact on the game. Yes. Um, so uh, we, one of the things that we wanted to start the this show off. This has been and, a point of contention. Yeah, Beth and I have been long. going back and forth on this, and that is 2010. The last time that the Bison were out at Ruse Field on the Inferno. Beth. Doesn't matter. Her point is, doesn't matter. None of these guys were playing. One of us was here. One of us wasn't. That's just and it. I don't think it matters. That's just it. I was not here in 2010. You can't live in the past, man. I am a fan. It, I, as a fan of any team, okay, you are so, going to live in the past. That's what's going to happen as right, fans. As a fan. So does this matter to the fans? You're does absolutely, this matter to the football team? Absolutely it matters to the fans. And it matters to the guys that played on that football I team before I have no them. problem with it mattering to the fans. You live in 2010. You you get all heated up and you complain all day long all you want. But do you think that it matters to the football players? No, it doesn't matter to the football players. But what did that? that's not what we're talking about here. 2010, of course, we're talking about the fumble that wasn't a fumble in the final play of overtime that lost, uh, that NDSU lost uh, in the quarterfinals there out in Cheney, Washington. That was... Eagles go on to win their yeah, first ever national title. They the national title. National and, title then, um, and they've done nothing since. North Dakota State rattles off five in between there. But... Uh, it was a beautiful catalyst. It was a beautiful catalyst. But none of these guys were even here. Now, That's I how still, long ago it was. I care about 2010. I still care about 2010. You continue to enjoy and that I'm moment. I'm going to enjoy All of 20. you as well. Well, it's not an enjoyable moment. That's just it. It's not enjoyable right, for so anybody. let it go. No, absolutely not. Always remember what got you to where you're going. Red turf, see red when you're out there. And remember... It was not a fumble. It was not. It was not a fumble. fumble. No, 100%. Fumble. I'm, I'm passionate about it. I totally. I I enjoy the spark that it gave the Bison from there, though. So you know, you gotta look for the positives. Redemption at Ruse. That's what we're calling it. Redemption at Ruse Field. That's what we're looking for. Should have thought of that for. sooner. That we're was good. For. Uh, yeah, I probably should have. Like All right, that. let's talk about last year's game, which was also insane. That game was what you want to see in a college football game. Back Ugh. and forth, the offense is going crazy. Onside kicks, interceptions. I like good hard defense. Everything that you wanted to see, 50 to 44, was the final. Absolutely phenomenal game. That's, oh, King Frazier. Um, this was just a great, great football game. Back and What'd forth you like between about these it two. The most. Just everything, the drama of it. Eastern Washington, neither team had a stranglehold on the game, but they were just 
punch and counter punch and and everybody was just going back and forth and if you liked offense you got offense and that's what you saw and so what you got to see team, what do they take away from this one though do you think well I, do, you, do you take something away from this absolutely you can still see because yes Bo Baldwin is gone on the offensive side that's that's what is gone. Uh, offensive coordinator is gone. Bo Baldwin, who was the head coach at Eastern for forever. See you later. He's at Cal now. Uh, but you can still take some things away from the defensive side. And that's basically what Easton Stick told us when we caught up with him earlier in the week. I think they got a lot of guys uh, returning on that defense. And so personnel wise, uh, you know, you're familiar with some of those guys. And then, um, you know, I think it's the same staff. And so, uh, you know, they're going to do some of the similar things. And, and games like these, you know, come down to who's going to make more plays. Who is going to make more plays? I think that's the, the perfect way to look at this because we saw a lot of plays get made last year. And it did come down to Trey Dempsey making a play and Lance Dunn making a play to get into the end zone in overtime. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm glad you agree with me. I have That's no great. arguments for once. Uh, this is this game today is part of the Missouri Valley Football Conference and Big Sky Football Conference Challenge. This isn't actually like an official thing. No. Nope. But the two conferences said, hey, we've got a lot teams of games from both scheduled. of our conferences playing against each other. So let's make a deal out of it. Uh, and that's what it is. There's really no bragging rights or a trophy or anything. Oh, no, there on the are 100% bragging rights. Oh, right, yeah, rights. bragging rights. But Absolutely. The, but the Missouri Valley kind of owns this uh, this meeting all time anyways. They went 4-4 four and four last year in eight games. But the struggle Missouri Valley's here, though, it. is the Missouri Valley's on the road for all of the games today. Yeah, that's a pretty rough. Except for Northern Iowa. But right. All, with, all but one game in the Missouri Valley versus Big Sky this season are on the road for the Valley. So this is the docket for today. Missouri State taking on North Dakota a few miles up the road on I-29 here. Uh, Cal Cal Poly will travel to Northern Iowa. I don't know what you're going to see out of that one. Cal Poly likes to run the football. Northern Iowa likes to play defense. So don't I'll, be surprised if that's a 3 nothing game at the I end root, of it. I root Valley in every football game unless the Jackrabbits are playing. That's a fair point. Uh, let's take a look at some of the other games that are going on. Western Illinois is at Northern Arizona. That game will kick later tonight. And uh, South Dakota State. So you're taking uh, the Bobcats? Montana State. Taking Go Bobcats. Bobcats. All right. 100%. Taking the Bobcats. Making friends in South Dakota, Beth Hool is making friends down there. Don't have any. Don't anyway. need to, all right? Okay. <laughs> uh, we are going to step aside. When we come back, we'll get our final thoughts. You'll hear us say that a few times. Our final thoughts on today's game before we get you football out at Roos Field in Cheney, Washington. This is the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football Pregame Show. Time for our final thoughts. Let's go out to Roos Field. Ryan Gellner standing by. Ryan. Beth, Alex, thank you very much. Uh, final thoughts for me today is the weather, but not what you're thinking. The smoke in the air will not be a problem today. What will or could be a problem is the wind. It's blowing from the west side of the stadium through the stadium to the east side. So when teams are going to the west side, what you're looking at now, that may be a problem for the kicking game and for the passing game for both teams. Now, Eastern Washington loves to throw the football. If these winds get to where they say at about 30 miles per hour for the gusts, that could certainly be a problem. That's what I'll watch for today. Brian? All right, thanks, Ryan. My final thoughts, I think, going into this game is how does North Dakota State defend the pass without maybe one of the best linebackers in the country in there, in especially in that nickel formation? Who are we going to see step up out of that secondary and make some plays? Turnovers, a big part of the game last year. So we'll see if North Dakota State can come up with a couple big turnovers here today. My final thoughts are on the defensive side for NDSU as well, and it was a formation that Eastern had last year that worked very, very well. It was a four-by-one, four receivers on one side, one receiver on the other. The Bison weren't ready for it, so there's no running backs, no tight ends. NDSU you will have to try to do that to, uh, well to defend it well today because Eastern ran it 27 times empty last year. All right, Beth, that's our final thoughts. Back to you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm looking at the defense in this one for the Bison. I want to know how they either respond without Nick DeLuca or how they step up and pick off the weak links when it comes to the Eastern Washington offense. You know, and I'll take uh, the opposite side of that and look at the offense. 72 points. Certainly, we probably won't see 72 points again. But was that a fluke? Was the execution that the Bison had a fluke? I don't think it was. So I would like to see that the offense continues to be efficient, as Easton Stick said, with his 5 of 5 passing 100-yard game last week. I would love 100% again. 100% completion sure wouldn't be terrible. We still have about a minute and 10 seconds before we send you back out to uh, Roos Field. So, um, Beth, how are things? <laughs> things are no, going well, Alex. 
things are going well, I think. Yeah, you know what? I'm really excited for this football game. I'm excited to see the Bison take on a real opponent. No no disrespect to Mississippi Valley oh, State, absolutely. but I think we can all agree we're ready for a real opponent. We're ready for somebody um, that, that's going to get our blood pumping a little bit, and I think this one's going to do it. I think this is going to be a hard-fought football game, but I think we've got the Bison in at least 10. We're going to have to learn about what Eastern Washington is. There's so much changing from last year to this year. We don't really know what this Eastern Washington team is. We didn't really get a good look at them against Texas Tech in their season opener. So what is this Eastern Washington team? Will they be around come the end of the year? We think the Bison will be, but will Eastern still be no, around? the Bison will be. All right, that's no. what we've got. We've got about uh, 15 seconds before we get you out to Roos Field. And uh, we just want to thank you for watching the Farmers Union Insurance Bison Football pregame show. We'll see you out at halftime. Brian Sean, Lee Timmerman, Ryan Gellner on the call. Thanks for watching.